So uh, I'm going to start in a moment. But before I start, let me take a picture of you. Because then my, my manager can believe me when I tell her that I gave a presentation wait, here. Because <laughs> like a panorama. There we go. There we go. Sure, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. So, so we should be on. Um, I don't hear myself that much, but that's fine. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. I, um, well, one, once I start, I'm, uh, uh, hi, I'm Max. My name is actually a bit longer than this. Uh, it's Massimiliano, but apparently not even the Italian passport office can get it right. Because my the, the latest passport I got, uh, it was spelled wrong. So I had to go back and change it. Uh, luckily, I have two. So I could use the other one in the meantime. So welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm a trainer at the Ripen CC. How many of you have never heard of the Ripen CC? About the right, well, Henning, yes, you've been mistreated by us so many times that you should know. Uh, although, here I'm just speaking for myself. Uh, this is not an official presentation from the Ripen CC. I haven't been sent here by the Ripen CC. I'm an IPv6, DNSSEC, and some other relatively new technologies enthusiast. Um, well, my first contact with IPv6 was about 10 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago. I was running an ISP at the time. And uh, so we, I decided to just go and try it out and see what was going to happen there. Um, so this is what I used to do. But nowadays, I work at the Ripen CC. And the reason I put this slide there, even though I'm not here officially, is to give you a bit of a background. Because what's in the slides comes also from personal experience that, came, that comes from uh, being there, from being a trainer. Being a trainer means that we travel around the ripe region, and I'm going to show you uh, the ripe region in a moment. Um, so this is Amsterdam, and this is where the office is. So actually, we were in this little building in the corner. You, do, you can't really see where we used to be, but we recently moved uh, to the central station. This picture is much nicer because this is the Royal Palace in Amsterdam. So we kind of pretend that we used to be at the Royal Palace. But we are a not-for-profit organization, and that's very important. We are one of uh, the five regional internet registries in the world. Uh, so far, we have more than 16,000 members. It means that 16,000 different organizations or people in uh, Europe, the Middle East, and Central Asia uh, wanted to get resources from us. So this is an idea of the regions and how they are divided. We are the regional registry with the highest number of countries, 76, while the highest number of IP addresses, can you imagine who holds them? Australia. Australia, yeah. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Can you imagine which one of the regional registries has the more IP addresses? So, North America, Erin, yes, here. Of course, for historical reasons. Um, and the highest num the highest population mark? Asia, APNIC. So we all have our own uh, nice details. And you know, you know, we are located in Amsterdam. Then there's uh, APNIC is in uh, Brisbane, down there. Do you know where AFRINIC is? Sorry? No? No, I, uh, when, when we look at it, we, we, you know, we always try to find a way to get projects where we can work together with Afrinix, so we have to go and visit them. Be because you want, no, it's east of Madagascar. Yeah, it's in Mauritius. So you, we always try to find a reason to go to Mauritius, you know, uh, having coordinated projects with, uh, with uh, Afrinix. Um, Laknik is in uh, Montevideo, is in Uruguay, and Aaron is in uh, Washington. Now, what do we do more specifically? We do, this is not a really comprehensive list. So we distribute IPv4, IPv6, and AS numbers, and this people know, know it very well. 
but that's, that's, not on, that's not what we only do. We do training courses. That's part of, uh, of um, the whole uh, ecosystem. So we, not only we give you something, we try to teach you how to use it. And then we manage the RIPE database, which sometimes I say people use it to stalk other people. Do you know what was the initial goal of the RIPE database? Do you have any idea? Uh, the who is database, OK. Yeah, to, to contact people when the network's on fire. Exactly. Perfect, perfect description. Con contact the people when the network is on fire. When there's an issue, I go on the database, I find out who is the uh, holder of those uh, IP addresses of that network, and I can have points of contact, email addresses, uh, phone numbers, and so I can contact the other party, make sure we can fix our issues. Then we support the community, and we have some interesting projects. Who has a RIPE Atlas at home or in the office? RIPE Atlas. I'm going to describe what it is in a moment. RIPE stat, we'll see it later. We can do resource certification, and we have tools that come out of this, come out of RIPE Atlas. We have Tracemon, Domainmon, uh, DNSmon. We have a whole plethora of other services, the Country Jedi, the IXP Country Jedi, and so on. And I'll, I'm going to show them, I'm going to show a few of them during the presentation. But let's, uh, let's start talking about IPv6. Um, it started in 1995. So sometimes we look at that, we look at it and we tell people, you know how old IPv6 is? Basically IPv6 is in the legal drinking age in the US, which could be represented as something like this, you know? <laughs> so uh, imagine as IP IPv6 came before the HCP in IPv4. So it has some of, the, some of the issues that you see in the protocol come from the fact that people back then didn't have any dynamic addressing protocol. So they thought, oh, let's make it automatic. And we'll see later on that this is, this is uh, an issue nowadays because we see that it's highly inefficient. It carries a lot of issues. But yeah, well, IPv6 is actually happening. It's coming. I spent the last probably 10 years giving tutorials and trainings. Uh, I also usually give talks to scare people and try to move them to IPv6. I remember one of the most notable ones was uh, New York City BSDCon in 2010 when I showed a counter and said, well, in 200 days, uh, IPv6 will be a reality because you'll finish IP ad IPv4 addresses. So I was basically catastrophic <laughs> back then a bit, but um, yeah, keep calm, I'm always wrong. <laughs> so far, I've always been wrong. It's happening, uh, it is coming, but it's much slower than, than we actually would like it to be. No, too fast. Too fast. <laughs> well, it is, it is slowly happening. Um, I'm not giving up. <laughs> so, okay, just to give you a bit of a background, Henning, actually operates a network in uh, Germany, in Hamburg. He's a member of the RIPE NCC. Uh, he has his own IP addresses, IPv4 and IPv6. No, you don't, you don't have an IPv6 allocation. My, my network had full IPv6 with 2002 or so. Mm -hmm. Then I decided it's better to remove it. Okay. And then I had to write code dealing with v 6 and discover even more shit. Yeah, yeah, okay. Makes sense, makes sense. So, well, he's not running it now. So one of my goals is to convince Henning to do IPv6. I will but make I'm it not one. Up. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving up. He's not giving up. <laughs> so what's, uh, what's going on? This is from Google. Google has run some statistics about IPv6. And nowadays, we are almost reaching 20% of the traffic over v6. So. In, and as you know, it's, it's growing. Um, now, do you, know, do you know what happened in the meantime? So, <clears throat> what happened in 2012? What happened in 2015? Do you have any idea? There are two important dates, actually three. So the regional registries are basically running out of IPv4. 
So if you now open a new, I want to open a new ISP here in, uh, in the US or Canada. Well, here in Canada or in the US. The other way. Yep. Probably 2015. Yep, 2015. Long. Exactly. Uh, but the funny thing is, the price for a Class C has dropped lately. It, it's, it's, it's almost like a success measure for IPv6 would be that the price that you could sell a Class C for it, which mm -hmm. is like 24, has um, dropped <coughs> by maybe 20 to 30 percent in the last year. Okay. Well, the price per IP address is going up per v4. So now it's between. As far as so we I'm know, between twelve and seventeen dollars per IP address. Um, it dropped. It dropped this year in in, in, Aaron, in the Aaron region. Anyway. Okay, okay. Well, probably because you can uh, you can also transfer them between uh, regions now. So you can transfer it, you can transfer addresses between um, APNIC and Aaron and Aaron and uh, Ripon CC. So the Americans are just grabbing more of your addresses. That's could be. I haven't looked at the statistics lately, but it's it could be possible. Could be possible. So it was, it was around twenty to twenty-two dollars an IP, and it's as you say dropped down to like um, sixteen, seventeen dollars an IP. It could be because of the big chunks of uh, legacy space that have been flooding the market. It could be because Cause, of cause that. Aaron, Aaron ran it first, if I remember correctly. You guys have right, had them for a little while, longer than Aaron. Did. We still have addresses available. I was getting there, uh -huh. so. In, uh, if you want to op to start a new ISP in uh, North America, in Erin, no addresses. So you have to you have two choices. Either you get on a waiting list. So every six months, every six months, Ayana gives back addresses to uh, all the regional registries, and um, but it's smaller and smaller. So the next chunk will be, I think, a slash 19. So you are in line. Aaron gets a slash 19, first come, first serve, the ones that fit in, and then that's it. You have to wait another six months. Um, or you can go and just buy them. And buying them has a price, as he was mentioning, between 12 and $17, or it was higher apparently last year. I don't know how the price was here last year, but uh, for us in Europe, it's, it's, been, it's been going up for a simple reason. Europe, slightly different policies, it's uh, running out slowly. So uh, when you, if you want to open a new ISP, you can still become a member, you can still get addresses, you only get uh, a slash 22, you only get 1,000 addresses, and after that, finished. We can't get anything else. So we give you enough to start, uh, and then it's up to you. You might want to buy more if you have more customers, but then at least you have, uh, you have a ground to start on. So you don't have to just get on a list. Now, who is leading here? Can you imagine who is leading the IPv6 deployment in the world? Asia, South Korea. Sorry? A third world country. A third world country. Oh, well, there they are. Yes, yes, the US. There they are. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. So you see on top of everyone, there's Belgium. A third world country. They said it. They said it. They said it. That's <laughs> true, but they managed, they managed to run the whole country without a government for, what, a year? No, 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 no. Year, uh, so that's a common misunderstanding. We were down one out of six. Okay, okay, okay. But, well, that worked, th that worked for IPv6. <laughs> and uh, do you know the story behind this, Philip or uh, Christoph? Uh, well, uh, I know, I, well, I... Yeah, but uh, you know, the, you know the, the, the whole story is there's, uh, uh, you know, well, Belgium is divided into two parts, basically, right? Can you confirm this? Depen depending, on the, depending on the language you were born uh, speaking, basically. The 50 people in the east and the 50 people in the west. Is in the yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so Belgium, Belgium. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> uh, they had an IPv6 task force, basically meeting uh, every month uh, or so. And um, so basically the two different parts the, um, have their main ISPs. And the main ISPs want to 
uh, fight for their, uh, uh, to, to show off, to see that they're better than the others. So they decided to try to implement IPv6 before the others, and they made it. So um, it was a political issue rather than a technical issue. We have to do it because the other part of the country shouldn't, uh, sh doesn't have to do it before we do. And then there's, well, Germany. Uh, Henning, you're not in there, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's Ireland, but then the US. And how many of you here are from the US? Do you have IPv6 at home? Yes, yes, yes. How many? OK. But you know what, what most of this traffic is? Mobile. mobile. No, it's mobile. Mobile, because the mobile operators are moving to uh, basically not 6.4. They give you native IPv6, and they give you a way to access uh, IPv4 content. It's cheaper for them because they have to run just one, um, one session for you, giving you just one protocol. But then they let you access whatever you want to get on, uh, on the v4 network. And then I went, actually, I got all the list down all the way to Canada as well, which still has an 18%. And there are some interesting cases like uh, Switzerland. Switzerland was the first country to go double digit, 2013. The main telecom there decided to um, push a button, deploy a transitioning mechanism, and give overnight IPv6 access to 800,000 people. And then they kept increasing as they went on. So uh, there are some nice cases. France was actually leading ones uh, because they, um, they have one uh, big ISP called Free. They developed the, um, the uh, yeah. No, 6RD, uh, and also 6RD is a transition mechanism initially called uh, after the, uh, the guy that invented it, Remy Depré, and created 6RD, and then the name was changed to Rapid Deployment. So this is, this is where, where it's happening. And what I wanted to do was, let's check the reality as well. So RIPNCC has RIP Atlas. It's, um, it's a project where we distribute um, these probes for free to everyone. You can put it in your home network. And this gives you, uh, this makes you become part of the biggest measurement of the internet. So with these probes, uh, you become part of a system where I can, where uh, everyone can, can query it and see what the probes are doing. Or you can actually ask the system to run uh, pings, trace routes to your own destinations. You just need to have credits. So what I did was I took RIPATLAS and I said, OK, give me all the probes in the US which have working IPv6. And those, I found 100, uh, 407 out of 1,003, well, 1,020, there are the total probes that are in the US. So that actually reflects the 35% the that we saw in the previous graph. Um, Canada, 25%. In the previous graph, Canada was at 18. But I wanted to compare them to places in Europe that have <coughs> uh, a higher, sorry, that have a higher um, IPv6 footprint. So Belgium has 47%, and that's, that's also the uh, same value. And Switzerland is almost there as well. But then I went on with this. We have a tool that was developed by a colleague. And um, the tool takes these probes, looks at all the ASNs in a country, and tries to make them ping each other, takes at least two probes in every ASN, and it creates a matrix of trace routes. And then it looks at where the traffic goes, if it leaves the country, if it stays in the country, and then it builds uh, a map about where the traffic goes. So I ran it for the US to get an idea, and this is what I got. This is traffic between American networks. Look where it goes. Apparently. So two US networks to talk to each other normally go through Europe, apparently. Or, well, through Hawaii. And this is IPv4. What's the situation in IPv6? Basically the same. So if you want, you can go and check. Uh, this is called the IXP Country Jedi. And there's a whole list of uh, all the countries are there, basically. We create uh, the same graphs for a lot of other countries. And you'll see that you find the most interesting maps about where traffic goes. So 
this is not really comforting. Are you sure it's accurate though? Because a lot of a lot of ISPs <coughs> meet in IXs yep. that you can't trace route. Like Torix, for instance, in mm -hmm. Toronto, the big exchange yep. here yep. uses an IP block that officially none of the members are allowed to route. So that's you the same that's the same for every IX. So, so you would by see it as, a, as an asterisk in your trace route, and you might not know where those two ISPs are meeting because you're seeing ISP one router, ISP two router, mm -hmm. blank space. Yeah, there might be some some uh, some um, um, locations that are not 100% correct, but there's so many of them that uh, I can well, show you. I'm, I'm just wondering, based on latency and stuff too, as yeah. someone who does a lot of voice over IP in North America. Mm -hmm. If a shitload of traffic was going by at Hawaii, I'd have a phone ringing complaining about it. Type of could be, yeah, thing. yeah. But it could also be that they are two very very small residential ISPs that talk through two different um, upstreams that actually meet. The US just doesn't have a lot of small ISPs, though. You you have quite a lot of them. Quite a lot Canada of small. Has a few, but the, mm -hmm. the US because the large Yep. They don't get the same sort of penetration as small ISPs. Okay. Well, that, that could be, but you can still, uh, we can, later on if you want, we can go and look at the data as well, because uh, this, uh, this is all public data. Mm. So you can, uh, we can look at it and maybe, maybe see if there's any inconsistency with reality and then check. Yeah. And then maybe the next run uh, is uh, we, do, we consistently do new runs of this, uh, this uh, system, and then might be that the next one be uh, more precise. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a couple of days ago, it was uh, changing a bit, moving a bit from this. There was the Akamai published the latest uh, state of the internet and just confirmed that Belgium is on top of everything. Um, but it's a strange way of putting it <laughs> <laughs> I know, but well, it is uh, still leading. Uh, but also that consumer electronics, most of them have no IPv6 support, which is impacting actually the quantity of IPv6 traffic that's seen there. Because smart TVs, many of them for instance, they don't support v6. So you might have working v6 from your ISP, but then you don't run anything, you don't use it because your smart TV doesn't uh, support it. And then this impacts on the quantity of traffic because then say Netflix or YouTube, which would be working on V6, are not doing it uh, inside your own, uh, in your home. Um, and then cable and wireless mob or mobile operators are leading there. Again, for the same, for what I just uh, explained to you, it's easier for a mobile operator to just give you IPv6, have one single session. If they were to provide IPv4 as well and make it dual stacked, you would need to have two different uh, sessions and now the uh, all the mobile operators basically, well, not all of them, but most of them, they just rent the towers and the devices. So they pay per sessions on there. And they want to go cheaper, so they just give you IPv6 in this case, rather than paying for two sessions for a, for, for a single user when it connects. So if you're staying at Henderson, how many of you are staying there? Did you notice that there's V6 running actually? No, oh, well, you don't have it. You just, I, get, I guess you stripped it even out of the kernel. No. Just to not see it at all. I run to Larry. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <coughs> well, but we don't have V6 here and not even at uh, uh, 90U. So this is, uh, um, unfortunately, uh, I guess it's because in Henderson you get connectivity directly from Rogers and they do have a V6 deployment. But then let's move over to discuss why do people implement IPv6? So see that Belenet gave us uh, a reason for doing that, uh, Philip. IP, IPv4 depletion was the main reason for our IPv6 deployments. They didn't want to buy more addresses. But also uh, Swarovski said a business continuity decision. So they want to be ahead of the curve and make it so that they don't, they don't suffer in the long run. But also now, 
if, you, if you've paid attention a bit to uh, what Apple has started doing, whenever you now submit an app to the App Store, it has to be IPv6 compatible. It has to work on v6. Um, so whenever you get a new update, well, that was June last year. So in the last year, basically, uh, all the, many of the apps that didn't support uh, IPv6 at the time hopefully have been upgraded, updated. So you now have uh, a larger number of uh, applications of apps in the App Store that support v6. And then we have Facebook saying <coughs> IPv6 is important. We pursue a mission of helping everyone get online. So we want to enable every person on the planet to go online and use Facebook to schedule their appointments. And uh, so they say we want to use IPv6. Actually, they do run IPv6 natively in their network. So where would you, where would you start? to do IPv6. Rome wasn't built in a day, we, uh, not even in a week, not even in a month. Uh, you know, they were Italians basically after all in Rome, so it takes a long time. Uh, I, in Milan we have a church that took 600 years to complete because they went bankrupt many times. So maybe IPv6 deployment uh, uh, hopefully will not make you go bankrupt, but uh, the first steps are not expensive when you want to go v6. So imagine thinking about your, uh, your uh, customers, thinking about what you want to provide them. Um, we asked people, what, uh, what is the biggest cost? It's man hours. Man hours, not the devices, not, uh, not the software. Well, uh, building the software around it was the biggest expense, but also training, making sure that they do the right thing. And all the work behind the scenes, and we'll see that also uh, later on, Users will never ask for IPv6. We have, a, we have a slide in our training courses that says IPv6 is not a product. So you won't have customers coming to you and asking, I want IPv6 internet. And I always say, well, I always give an example. I had my, my girlfriend um, lives in Switzerland, and she was part of the 800,000 people who got IPv6 back then. So I heard the news. I went to visit her and I said, I went to her house and showed her IPv6 is working here, you see? This is the thing I told you about many, many times, and now you have it, and I was so happy about it. She looked at me and thought, yeah, well, Facebook still works. I, <laughs> I, can see, I can see kittens on Facebook, and that's enough. So, so don't expect IPv6 to be a product that people ask for. So you'll, you'll have to factor that in. But what if your upstream has no IPv6, no working IPv6? Um, it's pretty common as an issue, um, although less and less. But um, you might run into this issue. There are ways to work around this. Either you can vote with your, uh, with your wallet, change your upstream, maybe change uh, your provider. Uh, when I moved to the Netherlands, um, I decided to get connectivity from the, uh, the only ISP at the time that could provide IPv6. So I, I have a slash 48 at home. I don't really do much with that slash 48, but, uh, but uh, that was nice. You work on networking all those grains of sand? Yeah, exactly, exactly. We'll see that. Uh, but how, how would you move? Get your, get your IPv6 addresses, first of all. Uh, make an addressing plan. I'm going to show one, an, an example in a moment. Um, start announcing your IP prefix or your tunnel address. Uh, dual stack all your network equipment or then add IPv6 to the servers and services and then target a test group. So if you look at the IPv6 deployments, there are some in the world, there are some countries that stand up because they are in strange places in the world and they get a high rate of IPv6. Uh, those countries, I'm not going to name them, but they are test beds for national telcos in other countries. So some countries decide, some. ISPs, some national ISPs in uh, Western countries decide, oh, we own the national telco in that other country, smaller, let's use that as a test bed and let's move them over to IPv6 and that happens quite a lot. Um, how do others do it? Make, it? make sure you exchange traffic over v6. So make sure your uh, IXP can do IPv6, that's pretty normal. Uh, make your services available over v6. Remember, everything is moving. Work on your core network. And then customers as the last phase. Um, 
This is a question that we get quite often. Why? Why do you suggest to go last phase for the customers? It's because you need first to acquire a whole knowledge of your services, of your core network. Move everything, move all your core network first, to make sure everything is stable, and then move the customers. Um, some people not, don't, don't agree with this, but that's what's uh, recommended by a lot of people in the community. And then, well, uh, benefits of IPv6 is that you get many, many addresses. Uh, as he was mentioning, lots of addresses for any grain of sand in, in the world. Uh, but also, it's about business continuity. So uh, research also shows that it's faster than IPv4, but there's a little asterisk I put there for two reasons. One is because uh, IPv6 doesn't get any NAT. And That's wrong. Well. It's uncommon. It's you say it's uncommon, but it's true enough. OK, there's a, there, it's, that's debatable. And I know. Well, that's why I put that. It's debatable. There is NAT for IPv6, but it's just a prefix translation. <laughs> you can't do NAT old style on TF on any platform. If you want to, you can. And I know people doing it. Uh, yep. Yeah. Just yeah. to say it's uncommon. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's uncommon. You, and the RFC says you shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, NAT66 RFC that says, basically, first thing, it says, please don't do that. Please don't do it. It's just for uh, experimental purpose. Don't do this. Don't do this in production. Uh, but anyway, you're not supposed to have, OK, fine. You're not supposed to have NAT. OK, so you don't have any translation. Uh, but also, this was something that was brought up by, uh, I met the, one of the engineer, network engineers from Twitter. And I was, uh, and Twitter doesn't do IPv6 yet. They're working on it. But then, but then I, I was telling him, like, why don't you, wh what's the reason? What's the reason for not doing this? And, the, um, and I was saying, like, yeah, everyone shows that IPv6 is much faster than before. And he was like, yes. But all those tests are done with very uh, new terminals. So all the latest iPhones, all the latest Androids that measure uh, best in, uh, in, all, in all those conditions. So there's a different factor that's not considered when they show you that IPv6 is faster in that case. By the way, NAT has zero measurable impact on TF. I don't know what other implementations are. There's no performance impact that could be measured. Are you sure? Even if you even if you have a large NAT with, uh, okay, okay, in other platforms there is an impact. So there is. So well, in this case you, uh, but also when you when you have NAT in IPv4, cater grade NAT, what do you do in your environment? What would you have to do to run v4 in uh, NATed v4 cater grade NAT in Europe, for example? Sorry? Have a big enough pool to net all your private IP queues. Yes, and then what else? What do you need? What else do you need by law? It's not, I know what you're coming to. With yeah, I'm getting there. Bullshit. Because, because. It's <laughs> not that easy. Because actually, netting gets you out of the surveillance process. Gets out of the? Well, you don't have to store the mapping between the private IP address and the public IP address. And the so port, yeah. The surveillance records you have to keep, they're perfectly fine with a completely useless private IP address. That's the law. Yeah, yeah, true. But you still have to log stuff. Well, you don't have to log anything but more than without that, because you don't have to net. Yeah, but yeah, what, what I was getting to is you need, you need additional infrastructure to, to at, at least log something. Well, yes, the and then. You need without that. There's no difference. Mm, not really, not exactly, but, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's also country specific, but the, the European directive is that you have to keep the logs for five years. Uh, it's a European directive, it has bugs. Yeah, of course <laughs> it does. Six, uh, you have to keep them for six months on the, where they have been logged, and then you have to move them to a different storage system, keep them at least for five years, and so on. So this has a high impact, a high cost impact as well. But then, um, not only I wanted to talk about benefits, but also about the dark side of the IPv6 moon. There was a, <laughs> now that's, that's where Henning 
comes into, uh, it wakes up actually. There was a, there was a meeting, uh, SINOG, Slovenia Network Operators Group, where they invited one of my colleagues um, and they came up with some interesting thoughts. So the slide I'm going to show you, the, two, the, the, the next two slides come from Job Schneiders. Uh, he gave this, he, he, used, he used these two slides to show what he thinks uh, about IPv6 and what the issues are with it. So those don't come from me, I just copied them. I have the source. So this is what uh, Job Schneiders thinks about IPv6. <laughs> Well, what, what he thought, what he put on the, on the slides there is IPv4 as, a, as an emoticon and IPv6 as another emoticon. Well, the same emoticon, just bigger. Now, uh, there's a wall of text here about what's wrong with IPv6. Um, since going through all of these could be time consuming and we have handing, we could talk for hours about it. Uh, I wanted to highlight a few, a few of the <coughs> things here. So first of all, coming from IPv4, the router advertisement, the HTTPv6 uh, uh, divergence in opinions, uh, religious war is not really helpful. Do you know the, the difference between the two? So you have router advertisements, the, uh, uh, systems getting stateless addressing, basically only receiving the, what the local prefix is and then um, statelessly uh, installing IP uh, addresses on their, on their interfaces, or you can go with the HCP, which still requires router advertisements to work, can also provide DNS information. Router advertisement now can also provide DNS information, but there are differences in implementations. So when you have um, all uh, Windows systems, you can't do DNS uh, uh, in router advertisements because up until uh, a month ago, Microsoft decided not to implement the RFC that specified you could, uh, you could put DNS information in the router advertisements. But then if you, if you have a network where you, have Android you want to have Android devices, then you, uh, you can't do uh, the HCP. So for Windows, the HCP is mandatory. Um, Android cannot do DHCP. So you have all these issues, all these religious wars, hopefully they're getting to an end, but they're also putting obstacles to the deployment. Uh, ICMPv6 is rootable, so ICMPv6 is one of the bases of v6. It it's used for a lot of different uh, dances and mechanisms, uh, but it's rootable. So you'll see it being rooted also across the internet. There are probes seeing that. And uh, that, is, that is an issue most of the time. Then neighbor discovery is very chatty. You see a lot of traffic for doing neighbor discovery. Neighbor discovery is when your, uh, your host basically it's ARP or uh, finding out what the local prefix is, give me, give me my address and so on. Uh, it's very, very chatty, holds uh, a lot of traffic. Then IPv6 extensions. There's extension, there are extension headers, so the uh, IP packet header in IPv6 is much smaller than in v4, but it's extendable with uh, extension headers. And there's a, a whole lot of literature about how ISPs do not support extension headers. So there's a chance that if you put an extension header into your packets, well, attached to your, your packets, then the, your packet will be just discarded by many systems, and that can happen. Uh, the <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of stuff has to do has to be done in software. Anyway. Yeah. So then next one: extreme care needs to be taken to avoid resource exhaustion attacks. Um, you have a slash sixty four. Slash sixty four is on your local network, and People can exhaust your resources by uh, filling up your neighbor cache, by trying to talk to addresses that are not assigned to any interface. That's r relatively common. But that's also a positive in that just scanning for ac active computers is mm -hmm. now relatively useless. Um, that's not entirely true. It, uh, it has been 
has shown that it's still still pretty doable because you have um, unless your systems old well even if your systems still do um, um, uh, privacy extensions so coming up with your uh, with a random uh, address random uh, slash six, uh, 64 bits second 64 bits then the, you still have you st you're still installing the address coming from EUI 64 so you're st you can still talk to that address and well, there's a and there's uh, a limited and then you know they derive from a MAC address so you well, can that's still what BSD does, but I've noticed Windows seems to just grab a random address a random yeah, Windows randomizes uh, even the link local address. So they randomize everything. Yeah, but, that, but that's still doable. That's still relatively doable. So it, uh, there are some papers that still show that it's relatively doable and so. Well, it's doable if you're on the local LAN, but it's not doable for remote hosts. Like, if you put up a web server, everyone in this room should know, and if you put up a web server mm -hmm. on IPv4, you will see hits on that web server within an hour. Even if that IP address has never been lit before, mm -hmm. uh, with Probably IPv6 good. you could put up the same web server. You won't see a hit on it in the next year. Yeah, but you still you still have uh, quite a bit of background noise even on v6. And there, there there's a there's a series of papers showing this. I have the I have them I have the list on my laptop. So I can if you want to, if you want to know more I can show you something <laughs> later on. So what where where were we? Uh, well, as I mentioned already, nobody asks for IPv6. They want to see their kittens, so it's fine. But then, extremely poor vendor behavior. Um, so some, some vendors either want you to pay more for IPv6, or they have a bad v6 implementation because at present, no one asked for it. So no one is using it, so it's completely buggy and, and has lots of issues. Then, next one. No existing concepts have been recycled. Um, you suddenly deal with multiple addresses per host. Uh, neighbor discovery is worse than ARP. There's no NAT, which is good for uh, friends here. There are colons in the addresses, which make them hardly readable. So these are negative issues, negative points. But the recycling of, con uh, of uh, content comes from the fact, as I mentioned, that IPv6 is more than 20 years old, so some of the concepts were not there when, when it was uh, designed initially. And then last, absolute failure to, delivery, to deliver on innovation. Um, when I, actually, that, this is very true. When I started looking at IPv6, one of the main features that were sold with it was, oh, IPv, IPsec is included directly in the protocol. Yeah, well, there's the ESP payload um, uh, extension header, right? So, awesome, yes. Uh, so there, w that was one of the main selling points. We can have uh, encryption directly in the, in the packets and then we're going to use it. Everything's gonna be secure. Has anyone ever heard of that? And, well, de deployed on the field. <laughs> well, heard of that, yes. Well, deployed? No. no. As, as there is no send, secure neighbor discovery. Not, not there. So the problem is uh, there hasn't been the level of attention that would have been required for many of the, of the um, features here. So, well, yeah. And as I mentioned, the ecosystem still immature. Uh, some, well, uh, Job put an example, Elasticsearch and many other DBs even have no, uh, IPv6 data types, so you can't store IPv6 natively. But anyway, yes? Um, you probably know this, but the, the fragmentation directly with IPv6 is also a major issue. You mean fragmentation in the distribution yeah, of the addresses? Well, you have fragments from the endpoints. You can't oh, yeah. routers or in between. Yeah, there's no, well, pa you know, pa you, mean, you mean path MTU discovery, where you, you're, you don't yeah, have. You know, a lot of these things are across time. Yeah. Well, that comes. Well, that comes from. Exactly. Yeah, I was. Uh, well, it's many people decided that ICMP is uh, dangerous, and ICMP, ICMPv6 even more so. 
but ICMPv6 carries PathMTU discovery information, or should. And then they, people filter it on their firewalls, which means that um, if you're trying to talk to a host that's behind uh, uh, a network with a smaller MTU than yours, and someone along the way filters ICMPv6, then you're not going to get back the notification that your packet needs to be smaller. So you just won't be able to talk to that host. <coughs> and that's, that's a common issue, and we're trying to, to teach people how to fix this also. But fragmentation is also in how the IP, IPv6 address space is distributed. Um, so we have so much address space. Uh, you know, it was decided some time ago by the ITF to only use uh, slash three. So only uh, one eighth of the total space. Can you imagine why? Sorry? Yeah. Well, those are other decisions. Sorry? Those were other decisions that were taken. Well, the routing tables are then decided by the regional registries, uh, so how they hand out the address space. There are two, uh, two explanations for this. So one is um, IPv4 was a mistake from the beginning, how it was handled. A lot of organizations initially got a slash 8, and they, they, don't need, they don't need it even now. So probably you've heard that last week. No, two weeks ago, MIT sold a slash 10 uh, for some money. Um, so the idea was, let's do it, let's take just one slash three, one eighth of the space. And if we see in 50 years that we've done things wrong with this system, we can go back, get another uh, slash three, and start from scratch with a different system. I prefer the second explanation, which is like, Okay, we reserved space for other planets. <laughs> it's much better. <laughs> I like it more. So every regional registry gets, got a slash 12. Uh, I can tell you data about the RIPEN CC. We gave address space to 77% uh, of the members so far, last time I looked. And um, uh, also the big members like um, um, uh, Deutsche Telekom or France Telekom, you can see they got a slash 19, for example. But 77% of the members, even the large ones, and we used 6% uh, of the space from that slash 12 that we got. So there's still a lot of address space left. Uh, so in fact, the way it's being allocated is doing, by doing sparse allocation. We left some space for all the ISPs and all the members so that in case they want to come back and get more addresses in the future, we preserve the routing table by giving them contiguous address space. So you will see just one, hopefully one entry in the routing table for the same, for the address space that's being enlarged for those members. Um, and then I promised you, I would talk, ab I would give you an example of, uh, of an addressing plan. This is, I tried to put on paper, this is an example of stuff I've done live by, ex by giving a training course this is an addressing plan for um, a network, an ISP, in Italy. So that's where I come from. So imagine you have an allocation and you get a slash 32. This is what's called address coloring. And I colored it so that you can see and understand. Basically, imagine you want to have all your loopbacks, all your devices with a loopback address. You can get the first, very first slash 48, which means you'll get the shortest addresses. That can be reduced to just uh, double columns. And then imagine you want to do loopbacks in Lombardia as a region. The reason I did a slash 56 and took two of these is because we have 20 regions in Italy. Uh, one every digit here represents, well, it's four bits, so you have 16 different values. So one digit wouldn't be enough for the 20 regions we have in Italy, and this is quite a nice example. And then I can take a slash 60 to do all the loopbacks in Lombardia in a city or the province. And then, uh, for example, imagine you have devices uh, across the whole area there, and you want to identify where the, the devices are. Some years ago, I was talking to a friend, and we were discussing, uh, he runs a small ISP, and we were discussing about, okay, what could you do with your allocation distribute addresses, do this, that, uh, loopbacks, and blah, blah, blah. And I gave him, I, I was joking. 
And I said, well, you could put, you have 64 bits, and it's, uh, it's quite long. So let's see if we can fit GPS coordinates in there. And six months later, he calls me and shows me that he did it. <laughs> so he has customers. He identifies where the, customers, where the customer is. So when he sends over the CPE, the CPE runs, has a loopback address that basically follows this scheme. And 64 bits of the addressing part are reserved for the GPS coordinates of where the customer is. And that's a nice way to use an IPv6 address. You know. so, uh, imagine you want to have all the loopbacks in Emilia Romagna. You have this slash 56, another slash 56 for all the loopbacks in Veneto. Or then you can go by POPs and define a part for the infrastructure. So the, um, the zero here, the mail servers could have a slash 56. So going ahead, you could put, you have mail servers and you have a data center. This is a POP. You still have two digits you can use for something. Uh, to describe where the mail servers are in the building or in the, in the data center. So this can be rack number and unit number. So you could describe things directly in the address and make it simpler to use. When people tell me, oh, subnetting in IPv4 was much simpler than it is in IPv6, you start showing the, uh, them this, and this becomes clearer. This becomes easier to see. So what I just showed you is described in, in a better wording and a longer explanation in a document that was pr uh, prepared by the uh, Dutch, um, <coughs> what's it called, a Dutch research network. It was uh, initially in Dutch. Now that was translated by a colleague at the Ripen CC in English. And if you, if you have, if you're going to receive a slash 48 or anything, a network from uh, one of your ISPs, then you can just go and download it and it shows you uh, a whole system for creating subnets, creating an addressing plan. But also, if you want to start looking into IPv6, there's a document that was provided by, that's provided by the RIPE NCC called RIPE 554, built for the uh, Slovenian government initially. Um, it contains all, all the features, all the uh, services, everything you need to, you want to have for your uh, devices to support IPv6. So you can use it for uh, uh, tenders, you can use it for uh, asking your vendors if they implemented everything, and so on. So it's used by different governments, uh, Slovenia, Germany, Sweden, but I know Switzerland uses it, and a few others that we haven't included in the slides. Also, yes? Yeah. Um, what would you point to point links? Like okay, point to point links are a very big dispute because uh, there have been five different RFCs. Yeah, I know. I saw <laughs> the last one says uh, if you want to build a point to point link, uh, basically, my personal suggestion is reserve a slash 64, 64 <coughs> and then use 127. Yeah, okay. So uh, the RFC doesn't say that you have to reserve a slash 64, but that's my personal suggestion. So the yeah. client would put his allocated uh, yeah. slash 64 on the Ethernet address of that device. I'm not talking about that point, so I'm not yeah. But then if you, do, if you do it this way, you're giving your customer only a slash 64, and you're having link local on the outside interface, which doesn't... Uh, you can still give them more than a 64. You should. You should. It just depends if they actually ask for it or not. Mm. Okay. Well, I didn't put it in here, but um, if you give a slash 64 only, then it will be a problem. The next generation of CPEs uh, follows a, an RFC. It's called HomeNet. And basically in HomeNet, everything is based on IPv6. So the CPE gets prefix delegation, so gets a prefix that's supposed to be much bigger than a slash 64 <coughs> from the ISP and uh, uses the, um, and for every interface, uses a different slash 64. So there's uh, all uh, layer three inside the house. The good thing is, if you have all on ethernet, basically you get a CPE with a 
I don't know, six, ten port uh, switch in the back, or switch, ten, ten Ethernet ports. You can connect any port to your ISP. You don't have to have the WAN port and the LAN port because the system sends out uh, uh, prefix delegation requests. And if it gets a prefix delegation, then that's becoming the uh, outside interface. Anything else becomes the inside interface. So you don't need to have any, any upstream, any one, or anything. And all the rules are managed internally. But on top of that, uh, you can connect another uh, CPE downstream to your main CPE. And the main CPE will do prefix delegation to the smaller CPE. So you can, have, you can even create loops, because it runs um, dynamic routing protocol. It runs um, um, uh, bubble inside. So um, I, have, I have that running at home uh, with a, diff uh, a whole set of CPEs. And I can also tell you how it feels to have only NAT64 in your home network, because by testing this, I broke IPv4 for a whole month at home. I couldn't, couldn't configure IPv4 in my home network at home for a whole month. So I had to run, uh, I had to run just IPv6 only. And the internet becomes a kind of a lonely place in that case. So, uh, well, because Skype didn't work, so my parents couldn't call me from Italy. That was quite a good thing. My mother wasn't, called me, wasn't calling me every day. So it was, uh, it was, uh, it was not, ni not nice under this aspect to turn IPv4 back on when it started working again, but anyway. Then, la uh, there's another document uh, we provided as uh, RIPE, as a community. Um, basically, we thought, What's the, one of the biggest issues when someone wants to uh, run IPv6 in their network? And it's uh, help desk. So if you have, if you have um, a whole series of uh, um, customer agents that talk to your customers, but they are not experts, what can you do for them? You can run, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, tell them to send the customers to go to testipv6.com. That's a website. They, the customers open the website. Opens the website. They can see there's a, there's a code appearing, and in the document there's a corresponding code with the actions that could be taken to fix the issues there. It's uh, handing proof. Don't worry. <laughs> so this is basically it. And let me do a shameful plug towards the end. We have, if you want to learn about IPv6, we have a free training course here that you can do uh, wherever you are, wherever you live. It's open to everyone. You just need to create an account on RIPE Access. So if you want to learn IPv6, go here. Uh, if you have any more questions, this is my email address. Uh, or uh, I have a Twitter handle where you can write me. And well, if you don't have any questions, this is the end. And if you know a language that's not in the list here, uh, please let me know, because we are always adding more. Well. Uh, that's it, because we are right on time. Japanese. If, sorry? Japanese. Japanese. Uh, it's not part of the ripe region, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>